It's Sunday morning, and we are in a study about everything in the Bible. I, mean, I don't even know how to pinpoint this message this morning, but we're going to talk to you about some of the things we've been talking about, and, so, and a lot of it has to do with revelation. Now, revelation is not revelations. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation is the word apocalypsis, A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S, A-P-O-K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S. That is a construction. It's not so hard. It is a form of apo, K-A-L-U-P-T-O. Apocalypsis comes from apocalypto. Apocalypto is the word reveal. Reveal, apocalypsis is revelation. And apocalypto, apo means a removal. And kalupto in the Greek language is the word cover. To remove the cover means to define everything so you can see what it's about. Now, if you'll turn with me to Revelation, the first chapter, not Revelations, this is what it will say. All right. I'm going to try to take you through some things this morning that most people will say, well, you can understand that. You can't understand it because they don't define it. The main reason you can't understand Revelation is because you don't know anything about the Old Testament. And the first verse, this says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We're going to take the cover off of Jesus Christ and tell you about him. Which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John the word signified is a very very significant word it's the word semiao s-e-m e-i-o-o semiao now that is a form of the word simeon S-E-M-E-I-O-N. S-E-M-E-I-O-N. That's the word where the Pharisees came to Jesus in Matthew, the 16th chapter, and said, Give us a sign that you're from God. Give us a Simeon that you're from. We got signs in the Old Testament. We got, we got uh, manna in the morning. And we got doves in the evening. That was our meat. And our shoes did not wear out. Not wear out. And that, and our feet did not swell up. Feet, no swelling. In 125 degrees heat, our feet didn't swell up. We got a cloud by day, we got a fire by night, and we were able to beat our enemies, and we want some signs from Simeon to you. The Old Testament word is the word U-W-T-H, Uth. That's the word that was used when God says, circumcision will be a sign from you to me that you are my believers and my people. He says that to Abraham, circumcision, says that to Abraham in the Genesis, the 17th chapter. Now, we know that circumcision doesn't matter anymore. We're circumcised of the heart as spiritual Jews, as spiritual Israel. So what he is saying here, some you need to understand, I'm going to give you signs all the way through this book. Let me tell you what a sign is. A sign is a pointer. 
Now, when you see, well, if you're riding down the street and you run across something that looks like this, and it's got a big pole up here, and it's got a cross here like this, like this, and there's some red lights on there, and you hear this, you see this bar come down, and these, you start hearing ding, 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 ding. That's a sign. What's the sign of? There's a train coming. A train. If you see a sign above a building that says fire stone, that don't mean that there's a, a stone that's burning with fire under that sign. It means there are tires for sale. That's what it means. Firestone tires bought here. That's what this is saying. What this is going to tell you all through Revelation, that in order to know the signs, you're going to have to study the Old Testament. Right here in the first chapter of Revelation, you've got, the seven candlesticks. I wonder where that came from. Duh. Oh, 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 maybe it's from the Old Testament. You reckon? Reckon. How's that for a Texas saying? <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at it over there. Look at it over in the 26th chapter of ex Exodus. To Exodus 26, seven candlesticks. Now, I'm going to show you what I believe it says. Verse 31, chapter 25, verse 31. Moses gets the Ten Commandments in the, eighth, in the 20th chapter of Exodus. He comes down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments. He goes up on the mountain in the 18th chapter. They left Egypt in the 14th chapter. Actually, the 12th chapter was the last plague. That was the Passover. They left in the 14th chapter, and they get here, and he goes up in the mountain and brings down the commandments of God in the 20th chapter. Then he starts in this 25th chapter telling them the things that he wants them to build for this temple or this tabernacle in the wilderness. And here in verse 31, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, and his shaft and his branches, his bowls and his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides. Notice that, out of the sides. Now most of the, well, let's read the rest of this. Out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Well, most usually the the Jews or people that are drawing the candlesticks will draw it this way. They'll draw it like this. Just two-dimensional. I don't believe that. On the Ark of Titus, if you look at the candlestick, and look at the middle of it, and you've got coming out of the, like so, if you draw a diameter anywhere in it, you're going to have three coming out of this side, three coming out of this side. If you draw a diameter here, you're going to have three coming out of this side, three coming out of this side. Or a diameter here, you're going to have three and three. So still using a diameter. The reason I'm doing that is because on the Ark of Titus, when they were bringing the candlesticks back out of the captivity, or carrying it away, excuse me, into the captivity, this is how on the Ark of Titus, I don't know if I put that up there, on the Ark of Titus, you can see, you can see this candlestick here is hiding behind that one and that means this is a three-dimensional and that you can see the difference in the links here. This is actually three-dimensional and this is showing it to you. And what this is over here, that is 
That is, let me put that on the board. This is very important because this is what we're talking about. Oh, I got one here. So when you put it on the board, what do you have? And this is what I've been showing you. What you have, well, excuse me, let me do it this way. All right. Like so. And what you've got is two things here when you have the se you have a seventh candlestick in the center. In Revelation, the first chapter, you've got Jesus being the center standing in the center of the seven churches of Asia. What you have is a hexagon. We've been talking about that, and you also have a star of David. Here's the star in the middle. I'll put to make the star. I believe that the pagans stole the star of David uh, from the Jews when they were taken into captivity in Assyria. I also believe, and I have a reason for this, that the, you can see the three-dimensional in this. That was the earliest picture we have of the candlesticks. And what is that about? Also, that has to do with these cherubim, the cherubim. The cherubim. Now, I'm going to try to explain some of these things to you so you can understand. The cherubim are, they started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve had sinned and partaken of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God placed a cherubim at the garden so they couldn't go back into the garden and eat of the tree of life and live forever. We talked about the tree of life already, haven't we? The tree of life is the same thing as Jerusalem, our mother, and it's the same thing as if you honor your mother, uh, the Bible says length of days and long life you'll have and if you honor the tree of life, which is wisdom and understanding, don't have time to go through all that, but you need to get several of our week's uh, teachings on this. Now, what does this have to do with Revelation? I'm going to kind of take you through and <coughs> teach you how to learn Revelation. You, everything in Revelation points to the real thing. Turn over to the fourth chapter. If you do not know anything about the Old Testament, you're going to be lost as a goose in this. Then the fourth chapter, we're going to see these cherubim. You've got two sets of beasts in the... Two sets of beasts. you got or two sets of angels and two beasts. The beast, the beast in Revelation 13 is like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. And then you have a fourth beast that was the beast with iron teeth. Now, the word the beast is the word to therion. And we have it described in Daniel, the seventh chapter. We know that the lion is Babylon, the Babylonian lion. The reason being, Babylon was the most regal. The most regal, the most 
what word could I use? Uh, abundant glory. The most glorious of all the empires. It straddled the Euphrates River. Euphrates come down, joined the Tigris River about 100 miles before you got to the Persian Gulf where we had that war, the, the weak war there in the early 90s and Euphrates and on the river was Babylon and it was 14 miles on every corner and the Euphrates ran through it and it was a glorious, glorious thing. That's why they identified with the lion. The bear is the largest carnivore, largest carnivore, that's one animal that eats another, and the largest armies that ever were was the Persian armies when they overthrew Babylon. And then they had maybe a million and a half or two million in their army. So we're describing the beast in Revelation 13. That's like a lion, a bear, and a leopard. Then the leopard was a picture of Greece. I've said this so many times. The leopard was a honed killing machine. If a leopard comes after you, you're going to die. A lion may shake you and throw you on the ground. A bear may throw you on the ground, walk away from you. Leopards hunt, they're single hunters, they hunt at night, they hunt because they're going to eat, and if they get you, they're going to kill you. They're one of the most dangerous animals to run across. They, you don't want to run across one of them. And Greece overthrew Persia by just hacking away at them, just at the haunches of the bear. They finally conquered them under Alexander the Great. The greatest, they even study his tactics at West Point today. He was a genius. Then the beast with iron teeth with Rome. So this is the beast. You got another, you got another word beast in there. Another word beast, and you'll find this in Revelation, the fourth chapter. And that word is not totherion the beast. That word is Z-O-O-N. Zun, it comes from Zao, which means alive. You remember the word quicken? Quicken, Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O. -O -O -E -O. When the Lord said he quickens whom he wills, that comes from the word poio, meaning to make. And Zun, we go to a zoo to see living animals. Zoon means alive. This other word for beast is zoon, and it means a living creature. Living creature. And that is a reference to, to the cherubim in this fourth chapter of Revelation. Let me show you that. It's a, revela it's a reference to the cherubim. Now, let's read some in this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. First of all, you've got to understand what heaven means. If you go into McClinic and Strong, you can take the H volume, and you look up heaven. They'll tell you about three heavens. They'll tell you about the heavens. The first thing they'll talk about is the heavens, that is the governments of the world. The governments of the world. Then they'll tell you about heavens. That's the air above us, the, the space that, where the birds fly and the stratosphere and the atmosphere, that is above us. And then <clears throat> you have heavens, wherever God is. When the Bible says there'll be new heavens and new earth, it's, gosh, I don't need to get off on this. That's first mentioned, it's mentioned in the 21st chapter of Revelation, but it's first mentioned in the 65th chapter of Isaiah, 
when God says there'll be new heavens, he's talking about Israel was the heavens because they were ruling everybody under one condition. You'll go against your enemy one way, they'll flee seven ways if you abide by my statutes and my laws. Abide by my laws, you can go against your enemy one way and you will be the heavens. You can find that in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. So Israel was the heavens. I'm talking to you about <clears throat> the, the Zun, the cherubim, and you'll find it here. Now, <clears throat> I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. It's when, because of what's going to follow up, this has to be Israel it's talking about. Now, we are heavenly Jerusalem, the church, and we're spiritual Israel. I don't want to make this hard. I'm going to try to make it easy as I can. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet. Now, I want you to notice, every time you see a voice, it's a trumpet. I'll put it this way. Every time you see a trumpet, it's a voice, always. What are trumpets for? They're to give you a signal, a simeon about what you're supposed to do. If you're in the military and you hear, I went to military school. I can tell you what that is. That's called rebelly. Get up. That's a word from the trumpeter that says, get out of bed, meet formation. That's what it's for. Or if you hear, or if you hear, da 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 charge. That, everybody knows what that means, and you hear, da 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 That means it's time to go to bed. That's taps. You see, trumpets are not just trumpets in the Bible. They're voices. If you read that 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, how, how are you going to know? Well, let me read that to you. Go back to 1 Corinthians. I'm, I'm not leaving Revelation. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. 14. I'm going to show you in this fourth chapter of Revelation, how easy it is to understand Revelation if you know something about the Old Testament. But you have to know the Old Testament. To, you can't define Revelations. And I think that means a beast. And I think he's going to come out and eat everybody up. <laughs> you can't look at Revelation. You can't. You can't look at Revelation like that. In the, in the 14th chapter... Of first Corinth of first Corinthians. Look at verse eight. If a trumpet make an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? It better be da 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 da. It can't just be what what do you think that means? Everybody knew what a trumpet sound meant. So when you find the seven angels of the first chapter with trumpets in the... Gosh, I need to slow down. Okay, let's, let's look at this fourth chapter again. All right. I, the first voice which I heard was as a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither... I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Well, if this is Israel, what is the throne in Israel? Temple. Huh? Temple. Well, not the temple, but it's inside the temple. Well, it's... Where did God come and sit down? The throne. The throne. <laughs> The Ark of the Covenant. That was the mercy seat when he would come down. He would come down out of that glory cloud and sit 
on the mercy seat. The mercy seat was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So as we're going through Revelation, every time you see throne, it's talking about Ark of Covenant. And here's the veil. Here's the seven candlesticks, which is the seven churches of Asia there in the 20th verse of the first chapter. And it's also the eyes of the Lord. I don't have time to go there. And the altar of incense is right here. And then you had the table of showbread. All of these right here were of beaten gold. So, and you had an altar here. Well, it probably wasn't like that. Like this. Had an altar here. Here. Then you had the brazen sea here. These were of brass. This was of brass. And these were of gold. What you, the way you can differentiate between this altar and this altar, it will say the golden altar. Golden altar. And it will say, if it says the altar where they offered the lamb or the brazen altar, it's talking about this. We don't know if that was brass. Some say they thought it was made of copper. So this is... This is a picture of us. The Bible says that the law was written on tables of stone. And inside this ark, you can look at Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and you can see that the tables of stone were in here. You can see that the pot of manna was in there. And you can see that Aaron's rod, that budded. And we rule with a rod, a scepter of righteousness. And this is the veil. And the Bible says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, that we enter in to the veil by new and living way Through the veil, this is the way, and you have to have a high priest sprinkling the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says, our hearts are sprinkled in Hebrews 10 and 22, 23. Our hearts are sprinkled now. If our hearts are sprinkled, they're sprinkled with the blood of Christ, and a blood baptism was a death. And we're elected unto obedience and the sprinkling of blood in 1 Peter 1 and 2. So our hearts are sprinkled. And everything, everything over here, over here is equal. To, I want to draw this with broken lines. broken lines because this is us over here know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and our hearts are sprinkled our hearts the Lord is written on fleshy tables of our hearts there in 2 Corinthians so everything here is equal to everything over here and the Bible says when we enter in by a new and living way, a new and living way. And what kind of way is that? Hodos. Narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. There's two ways, a narrow way and a broad way. We enter in by a new and living way, but it's not us. It is the high priest. Since this was blotted out, not the law. The law was not blotted out. 
the law is alive and well in us. There's two parts to the law. What are they? Two parts. Does anybody know? What? 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 Thank you. <laughs> she got it. You get an A for that. <laughs> the spirit and the letter. The letter is all those rituals. The letter killeth. And the spirit giveth life. You can find that in the third chapter of Second Corinthians and other places as well. So, everything over here is equal to everything over here. I'm going to move into this with the cherubim slowly. Might take me two or three or four weeks. I don't know. All right. Now, so, a new and living way, that is the narrow way, and that's the word Thalibo. And there has to be a high priest that enters in, brings the blood of the goat off of the altar and sprinkle it on our heart. Who is the high priest in the New Testament? Huh? That's right. Melchizedek. Melchizedek is now the high priest, and you're going to see that in the fourth chapter of Revelation. What happens to the old priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood? Aaron was a Levite that was the fourth son of Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel in that 32nd chapter of Genesis. So, everything over here we enter in by a new and living way through the veil. The way Melchizedek comes in and sprinkles our heart is through the veil, and then it says, that is to say. And what does it say the veil is? His flesh. His flesh. His flesh. That's the veil. His flesh. And the flesh. What is the flesh according to John 6? What is the flesh? The flesh is the bread. The flesh is the bread. And Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. The Roman Catholics have really twisted that. It's against God's law to eat flesh, human flesh and drink human blood. That was an ancient idiom when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Then he turns around and tells us what it is. He said, for my flesh is... He says, here's what it actually says. The flesh of me is indeed. The peculiar thing about that, it doesn't say my flesh. It's the translators translated it wrong. It says te Flesh, S A R X. The feminine flesh of me is alethes. A L E T H E S. Indeed is the word of truth. So when you eat flesh and drink blood, the flesh of me is indeed, the blood of me is indeed. Alethes, and alethes is a form of A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, -E -E which is the word truth. Truth. And aletheia is a form of lanthano. And lanthano means to hide something 
or conceal. Placing the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet in front of a word, as a negative particle. You'll always say neg part in your... It negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. Alanthano, which is just the way you write alathea, the way we would write it, means not to hide anything. So when you tell people the truth about things, you've got to define everything. You can't just say, we think this means, we think these are beasts, or this is a, there's a beast world system. No. Or they think that, they think the beast is a man, and it's not. Because totherion, totherion is neuter gender, and every, that's the antecedent of a him and his in the 13th chapter of him and his. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. That's actually the word A-U-T-O-U. Autu, and autu can be masculine or neuter gender, and it has to follow the gender of the antecedent. And the antecedent is totherion. That's neuter gender. These him and his is that's a bad translation on the part of the translators. How can the translators be so wrong? Half of them were Roman Catholic. And boy, they did a lot of compromising in the, in the translating room. That's why I go into the original text. I don't agree with a lot of what the King James Bible says. It's not the King James Bible that's the inspired of word of God. It's the Textus Receptus. The New Testament was written in Greek. Textus Receptus is a Greek word, is a Latin word that means the received text was in Greek, not English. There was no English 2,000 years ago. Now, where was I? So, everything over here so the high priest comes in, sprinkles our heart. Does the heart have anything to do with being sprinkled? Uh, does the Ark of the Covenant, did it get up and say, I don't know if I want to be baptized with blood? Did it have to say, okay, I want to accept you as my personal Savior? Can the Ark of the Covenant talk or feel? Can we... When we're dead in sin, we don't have any feelings or thoughts spiritually at all. Now, let's go back to this fourth chapter. Well, I was going to tell you, the flesh is the bread, the bread is the body, and the body is the church. The Bible says that. There in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 17, we being many are one bread and one body. We're the bread. We are the truth. That's in us. And the flesh is feminine gender. So, back over to... So, Christ comes in and sprinkles our hearts the same way the Aaronic priest would come in and sprinkle the, and sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant. Our hearts are sprinkled there in Hebrews 10, 22. Now, let's go back over here to the fourth chapter of Revelation. I did four and a half years on the book of Revelation on Sunday night. We had 236 messages. Then I came back and did about 40 more. Now, so we're talking about Israel here. And immediately I was in the Spirit and beheld a throne that's the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God would come down out of the glory cloud. A throne it was set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. So when you find the throne all through Revelation, it's going to be a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, where does he sit now? He sits upon fleshy tables of our hearts. That's where he rules from. That's why he says, I will not live with an harlot there in the fourth chapter of first corinthians then he says he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone 
and there was a rainbow round about the throne. A rainbow. I don't know how it's set, but let me tell you this. The rainbow, the word rainbow is I-R-I-S. Iris. Iris was the goddess of the rainbow. You remember, I don't want to confuse some of you. I'm just going to say this real slow. You remember the iris of the eye? God told Israel in Zechariah, the first chapter, Israel is the apple of my eye. Apple is the word babal. It means pupil. Israel is the pupil. That's the opening in your eye where light goes in. Light goes into the eye. The outer portion of the eye, and this has to do with the cherubim, is a wheel inside of a wheel. And he said, anyone who touches Israel touches the apple of my eye. Anyone who touches the church is punching me in the eye. And that's why when he comes back in Revelation, the 19th chapter, he's coming back with eyes as a flame of fire because he has been punched in the eye by the world. And whenever that iris of the eye closes up, when you get punched into the eye, the outer wheel that's in the wheel is a retractable curtain and it, and it actually closes up to protect what's inside the pupil of the eye. And that's the iris. Now this wheel in the wheel has to do with the cherubim. And that, I don't need to get into this fast. It's going to take me some time to go through it. Now, let me erase some of this. All of this is a part of the same picture. Let's go back to Revelation. And what I'll do, I'll go over and over some of this so you can see it. Let's go back to Revelation. So we're talking about Israel here. Israel is the heavens. And we see one sitting up on the throne. And there's a rainbow and iris. an iris around the throne. Or let me put it, there's a, that's the word rainbow. Now, the first time we see a rainbow in the Bible, where is that? Genesis, the ninth chapter. We see a rainbow And this is going to direct, connect directly to Revelation, the fourth chapter. Because you've got the beginning of the covenant of God. With four creatures. In Genesis the ninth chapter. Let's look at that real quick. Look at Genesis 9. You say, Jim, I didn't know the Bible was this complicated. God is an intricate God. He's not some simple-minded God that these preachers make him in these churches. Go to Genesis 9. All right. In verse 8, now Noah is coming out of the ark. The 7th and 8th chapter, he's in the ark. He's in the ark for 370 days. It rains 40 days and 40 nights, but he's in there 370 days. Then he says here, he's coming out of the ark. Verse 8, God spoke to, spake unto Noah, 
and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And here's who I'm going to establish my covenant with. Verse 10 needs to be in bright, shining, blinking lights. And with every living creature that is with you, I'm going to establish my breath. Covenant. Oh, by the way, that is a form of the word create. Create is the word bara. It is a derivative of the word covenant. That is a righteous word. A righteous word. In the beginning, God created. It means to cut and make fat. It doesn't mean make cellulite. The fat of the land was the richest of the land. The fat of the crops was the richest crop. The fat of the cattle was the best. So when the earth becomes without form and void, that's not in the creation in the second verse. Don't have time to go there. God said, all that I created, I created nothing in vain. The word in vain is the word tohu. And the word without form in Genesis 1, 2 is the word tohu. Isaiah 45, 18, he said, I didn't create anything in vain. Therefore, when you find in the beginning God created and then you find and everything was without form and God said, I didn't create that, then something happens between the first and second verses of Genesis and that's where we find Satan must have been cast into the earth. When you look at Revelation, the 12th chapter, and Satan is cast into the earth with the third of the angels of heaven by Michael the archangel. And when he's cast into the earth, the way you find where Satan was cast into the earth, you look for his nature in the scripture. His nature is found in Genesis 1, 2. Without form, without form, void and darkness. On the face of the deep is the nature of Satan. That's where he corrupted all of the earth when he was cast into the earth. Now let's get back to Revelation. Let's get back to this. I've got to show you this because this has to do with the fourth chapter of Revelation. Now what is he going to establish his covenant with? With the every living creature, with the fowl of the air, the cattle of the field, and every beast of the earth. With the fowl, F-O-W-L. With the fowl of the air, with the cattle of the field, and every beast of the field, every beast, and man, and you. So wherever you find these, Wherever you find these, you find the four-faced cherubim, which is a sign of the covenant of God, covenant of God, and the king of the fowl all through the Bible is the eagle. The king of the cattle is the ox. The king of the beast is always the lion and man. And you're going to see these four-faced cherubim that have the face of an eagle, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and man. And that's very important from one end of the Bible to the other. It is crucial to understand. And then he goes on down here and he says, 
and I will establish my covenant with you, and neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by waters of a flood, but it doesn't say anything about heat here. The earth is heating up according to the 16th chapter of Revelation and according to the 8th chapter of Revelation. Neither shall there be any, any more be a flood to destroy the earth, but it doesn't say anything about heat, does he? And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I will make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for a perpetual generation. I do set my bow, rainbow. Really, it's not a rainbow. It was a rainbow, but it doesn't mean something that we think of. The word bow is the word kaseth. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. Q-E-S-H-E-T-H. Kaseth means a bow for bending. It means one for shooting or for strength. I said the goddess of the rainbow was called Iris in mythology. And this is, this is one where an archer is pulling back the bow to fire it at people. In the ancient world, when they hung their bow on a wall like this, that meant they were at war. When they hung it like this, oh, excuse me, that meant they were at peace. When they hung it like this towards the bow going towards the ground, that's when they were at war. God hangs his bow like this. This is a war bow. That's what it is. Was that war he was having with the people of the world? Oh, yes, sir. He don't need to get out a rifle or shoot you with a bow and arrow or a spear. He's got lightning bolts and earthquakes and whatever he wants to use. Now, let me finish reading this. I set my bow in the cloud. So anywhere you find a rainbow, it has to do with war. Bow, I set my bow in the cloud, and shall, it shall be a token of a covenant between me and the earth. A token, an oath. It shall come to pass when I bring a bow over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I'll remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Have you noticed something here? He didn't make a covenant with the fish. Why? They were in the water. They weren't going to drown, were they? No, they were at home in the water. Now let's go back over to Revelation. <clears throat> I want to show you that this is talking about the literal, uh, the literal temple. It's going to be a spiritual temple. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and up on the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed with white raiment, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Who were these twenty-four elders? The Bible will tell you if you know anything about the Old Testament. We go back to the twenty-fourth chapter of First Chronicles. It will tell you about these 24 elders. And they were clothed in white raiment. All of the high priests, when they were tending to the temple, wore white linen garments. And look here. First Chronicles 24. It's going to tell you about the sons of And this, believe it or not, this will connect with what I taught last week if you come back each week till I can get through this. All right. 24th chapter. And these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron. Aaron was the high priest. Moses was his younger brother. 
Moses was three years younger than Aaron. Three years younger. You had Jacob. His name is changed to Israel. And he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve sons. He has twelve sons. I won't go through all of them right now. You can look, you can see them in the 29th and 30th chapters. You can see where they're being born. And this will be the nation of Israel. And the firstborn is Reuben. Secondborn is Simeon. Well, he was a scoundrel. Reuben was unstable as water. This, <laughs> it, when God loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, you can't say, well, God knew how evil Esau was. Jake, nobody was more evil than Jacob. He lied to his father. He lied to his brother, cheated his brother out of his birthright, lied to his father-in-law, stole from his father-in-law. That's grace. And the third born was Levi. Fourth born was Judah. Judah. And Levi, out of Levi came the priesthood. The priesthood. And then Levi had several sons, had three sons. And then out of that would come more sons. And Aaron would come along later. And Aaron and Moses and Miriam, they all had the same father. And Aaron, you had to be a son of Aaron to be a high priest. So, let's go back where we look at. Okay, now, these are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no children. You can look at them in the 10th chapter of Leviticus. They offered strange fire to God, and God killed them on the spot. You had to do everything exactly right in the temple. And had no children. Therefore, Eleazar and Ithamar executed the high priest's office. From this point forward, the only two high priests would be Eleazar and Ithamar and their sons and grandsons and great-grandsons and so forth. And David distributed them both, Zadok, the sons of Eleazar and Ahimelech, and the sons of Ithamar, according to their offices and their services, and there were more chief priests found a, of the sons of Eleazar than the sons of Ithamar, and thus they were divided among the sons of Eleazar. There were sixteen chief men of the house of, of their fathers, and eight among the sons of Eleazar. Eight and sixteen is twenty-four. That is the twenty-four elders, and we can see that in Revelation, and we see that later in the chapter. And they all had white raiment, and they had crowns on their heads. What do they have crowns for? Well, let's look at it. Look at Exodus 28. Exodus 28. If you don't know this is in the Old Testament, you're not going to understand it. Exodus, the 28th chapter. Exodus 28. All right. I'll be there in a minute. All right. Exodus 28 and verse 36. Thirty-six. And it's talking about Aaron, verse 35, and it shall be upon Aaron a minister, and his sound shall be heard. There were bells on the bottom of his, of his get up, his robes. So in the event he went in and made an offering, it was as long as the bells were ringing, everybody was okay. That's what they knew. And when he goes in into the holy place before the Lord, 
And when he cometh out, that he die not. And as long as the bells were ringing, they knew he was alive. God struck a man dead for doing one thing wrong in the temple. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace that it be upon the mitre, upon the forefront, the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall always be upon his forehead or upon the foreheads of the high priests, that they may be accepted before the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go any further than this. I just want you to know that you can look at Leviticus 8. You'll see that same thing. Leviticus 8. Leviticus 8 and verse 9. And he put the mitre upon his head and upon the mitre even on his forefront. He did put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. It's called a golden crown. Now what are these priests of Aaron going to do with their crowns? Well, let's look at the rest of this. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. I don't know if that's what God had inside of this Holy of Holies. Oh, by the way, the Holy of Holies was called the house of God. Within the veil was called the house of God because he came and came down upon the Ark of the Covenant and live there. Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? Then you've got our hearts are being sprinkled. You have the law written on fleshy tables of our hearts. This is equal to us over here. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Here's the throne, here's the lamps. In front of the throne is the seven candlesticks. That was the only official light in Israel. So they were in front of that. Which are the seven spirits of God? Whew. What are the seven spirits? Go back to the first chapter. We see Christ standing amidst the candlesticks. And the candlesticks are a picture of the seven churches of Asia. And Christ has got seven stars in his right hand in verse 16. And verse 20 is one of the most important verses in the whole book because it is a glossary for the whole book. Anywhere you find the seven angels with seven trumpets in 8, 9, and 10, and you find the seven angels and over in in uh, the 15th chapter and 16th chapter of Revelation. The mystery of the seven stars, verse 20, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven stars, Pleiades, gosh, is it, do we need to go there? We don't have time to go there. The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Word angel, I remind you, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, means messenger. Boy, we need to throw away the word angel and just put the word messenger there. Was Gabriel an angel? Yes, but he was a, he was a messenger. He announced to Daniel about the 70 weeks. Was Michael an angel? He was God's death angel. He killed 185,000 men in one night by himself, and he didn't even know karate. <laughs> killed 185,000. You think you're that tough? 
He was as tough as nails. He, he's the one that threw a third of the angels out of heaven in the 12th chapter of Revelation. Now, so what we're doing is describing this, the temple, but it's describing the spiritual temple of God, which is us. And then he says, and before the throne there was a sea of glass. That's not so hard if you know anything about the book of Exodus, the 38th chapter. Go to the Exodus, the 38th chapter. You can't find the book of Revelation unless you go to the Old Testament. It was a sea of glass. It's not Blondie's sea of glass or whatever that was, song she had. Heart of glass. Heart of glass. <laughs> I think of that when I run across this. Heart of glass, yeah. Not her heart of glass, yeah. In Exodus 38, if you know anything about this, you're going to be able to understand that. Exodus 38, and God is giving Moses instructions about making this brazen sea right here. The brassy sea. You can see that in 1 Kings, the seventh chapter. You can see that. We'll look at that in just a minute. In verse 8, And he made the laver of brass. They replaced the laver as Israel grew with the sea, with the brazen sea. It was large. It was quite large, and it would... It would bathe all the, they had spigots on it, and it was, and it was uh, set upon 12 oxen, two facing north, two facing south, two facing east, and two facing west. I've got a picture of that at home. Need to bring that next week. And he made of the labor of, of brass, and of the foot of it of brass, of the looking glasses of the women assembling assembling at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He told all the women, they did not have glasses like we have, where they spin this sand and they put silver on the back of it. They had polished brass. In fact, in the movie, The Ten Commandments with Moses Presley, by the Lord God. <laughs> Moses was tongue-tied. He did, couldn't have stood up there and said, by the Lord God, let my people go. He told God, I'm tongue-tied, I can't talk. He said, Aaron will be your spokesman. He will be your prophet. He'll speak for you. So he wasn't up there looking like Elvis with a big rod in his hand, you know. <laughs> Just <laughs> stupid. Whoever, Cecil Bean of Mill didn't know what in the world he was doing there. Anyway, where was I? Okay, so he makes this, the, in that movie, I remember Nefertari, the princess of Egypt, she was looking at herself in one of these bronze glasses. It was made of brass. They'd polish it real bright, but they couldn't see themselves real clear. So that's what this glassy sea was. It was right here. Look at that over in First Kings, the seventh chapter. Like I said, you can't understand Revelation without knowing the signs. First Kings, now this is where Solomon is building the, temp, building the temple and building all the parts of it. And First Kings, the seventh chapter, <clears throat> verse 23, and he made a molten sea Ten cubits. A cubit was about the distance from the, from your elbow to the end of your hand. About a foot and a half. Ten cubits, one brim to the other. It was about 15 feet wide. That's why they called it the sea. For it was round all about, and its height was five cubits. That's seven and a half feet. 
and the line of the thirty cubits did compass it round about, and under the brim of it round about there were knobs, the little flowery things, compassing it ten in a cubit, compassing the sea round about, the knobs were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood upon twelve oxen, and three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking towards, I said two while ago, three, the south, and three looking towards the east, and the sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward. And it was an hand breadth thick, thick as your hand, and the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with thousands of lilies, and it contained two thousand baths. That's why he called it a sea. And every morning the priests would go to this sea, they would go to this sea, they would wash off at these spigots, they would wash all over, and then they would go up here and offer their sacrifices to the day to the uh, this brazen altar, and then they'd come back and wash their hands and their feet. That's where foot washing comes from, hands and feet, and that's where the that's where the the Pharisees asked Jesus, "Why don't your your apostles wash their hands before they eat?" Then that fifteenth chapter of Matthew, they had they had a ritual that they would as they was going to eat, everybody washed their hands because their hands were their utensils. And they would dip into a sop and put it to their mouth. But they had receptacles where they had water in them. They called it holy water. And they would dip their hands ceremonially or ritualistically down in that. And they would go in there. And Jesus said, you make the word of God of none effect by your traditions, by your paradosis. And none effect means no Lord. I'm not your Lord when you go for these traditions. Now let's go back over here to Revelation. Before the throne was a sea of glass. Well, that's not hard if you know something about what it was made of. But you're not going to know that without knowing the 38th chapter of, of Exodus. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Zoon, four living creatures. I wonder what they're about. Genesis 9. Wherever you find these, wherever you find the lion, you find the ox, you find the eagle, you find man. In that form, you're going to find the covenant of God present. So this is us here. The first beast was like a lion. This is the cherubim. And the second beast like a calf or an ox. And the third beast had the face of a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. These are the four that God promised his covenant to over in Genesis, the ninth chapter. Isn't that correct? Y'all see that? Well, we kind of put a big big piece of the puzzle in right here, didn't we? It just ties it together, doesn't it? And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes. Full of eyes means very intelligent. That's an old saying. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. God is three times holy. You can see that in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, chapter... I hope I'm not losing you. I'm trying to go slow enough to let you see. If you know what's in the Old Testament, you can learn what's in the book of Revelation. It's not hard once you know the definitions. You understand what I'm saying? You're going to know something about the elders. People say, what do you think the elders are? You know how many times I've heard that in a church? 
Well, I think there are the 12 apostles and the this and that, and it's like. It's like the 144,000. Yeah, it's like that. The Bible plainly states who it is. I don't have time to go there. Holy, 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 and look over here in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. In the year, verse 1, that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That, that's talking about the, the robe. And above it there were seraphim, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. There's your trinity right there. Three times holy is what he is. Now go back over here to Revelation, the fourth chapter. So we found out that the covenant that God made, remember, there was a rainbow around the throne, a rainbow around the throne. This has to do with the covenant and the four beasts, and the rainbow was there in Genesis, the ninth chapter, wasn't it? With the four that he promised to. Now, look here. And when these beasts gave glory, these not... Tothereon, when these Zun, living creatures, gave glory and honor and thanks to him, we're not talking about literal flying angels. Him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, and the four and twenty elders fall down before him. Who are they? The sons of Eleazar and Ithamar. They're not any longer when when Jesus is crucified on the cross, everything in the Old Testament, not the law, but all the rituals of the priesthood are blotted out. They don't count anymore. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne to worship him forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. the priest of Aaron, the only two left, and all of their descendants was Ithamar and Eliezer. And all, of their, and all their descendants come before the throne, and Christ is on the throne, and they cast their crowns to him and say, you're worthy to be the high priest, and we no longer are. Can you see that? Is that pretty simple? If you know who these guys are and what they do? Thou art worthy, O Lord. They're throwing... When we get to heaven, we don't cast our crowns at anybody. People say, well, I'm going to cast my crowns at his feet. You ain't going to have any. <laughs> the crown belongs to the high priest. And the Aaronic priesthood... This is figurative language. This is allegory. It's, it's figurative language. They're not going to literally do that. They do that in the sense they turn it over their office to Melchizedek, the high priest of God. And when you read about Melchizedek in the seventh chapter of Hebrews and the sixth chapter of Hebrews, you f and you find that Melchizedek is the priesthood over the temple, over the church. That's us. We have a high priest right now. He has made us priests and kings. How can we offer sacrifice if we're not a priest? When we give our bodies living sacrifices, you can't do that anywhere in the Bible unless you're a priest. He made us priests and kings. Now, I got so many places to go. How much time do I have, Mike? We waded through that fourth chapter, didn't we? I don't know quite what to do. I got all these cherubims to go through. Let me give you something in Isaiah, 
37, 16. Isaiah. Uh, 34. What am I talking about? No, 37, 37, 16. 37, 16. Isaiah 37. All this fits together. This is Hezekiah crying out to the Lord. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, the cherubims, yet a cherubim on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, their wings reached over and touched the tent. Some say the Ark of the Covenant was placed this way. Some say it was placed this way. I don't know. The Bible says that the, the veil was woven with cherubim in it. And they all had the face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and the face of man. I don't know whether McClinic, not McClinic and Strong said they're all on one neck. I don't know that that's true. He may have had, he may have had one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, some woven into this, and a couple of them woven into the veil. And the Bible says the four beasts were around the Ark of the Covenant, which would be a picture of the covenant be around our hearts since our hearts are sprinkled. If you can understand where all this came from, but you can't teach Revelation without knowing something about the Old Testament. You can forget that. So he says, you dwell between the cherubim. That word dwell is the word yashab. Y-A-S-H-A-B. It means to marry, build a house. Christ is married to the church. And look at Hebrews 3 and 6. Hebrews 3. I didn't even get to my cherubim up there. Hebrews 3 and 6. I've quoted this so many times. The inner sanctuary was called the house of God where he was married to his church. Married to Israel. But Christ as a son of his own house whose house are we. He lives in us just like he came down and lived in Israel on top of the Ark of the Covenant. He is in us. We're spiritual Israel. We're circumcised of the heart. Circumcision is not outwardly, but of the heart. That's what makes us spiritual Jews. I don't know if I should go into... Let me go ahead and kind of wade into something. I'm not going to be able to get to all of it. But let's go back here to Ezekiel, the first chapter. I may start it and finish it next week. Now, I've established that wherever you find the cherubim, or the cherubim, pronounced K, like a C H E R A V I M, it's pronounced carabum, like the hard K. Ha. Huh. Maybe I'll just read a, a verse 10, then I'll back up. It's talking about a wheel and a wheel. Hmm. It's talking about four creatures here. 
For the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. That has to do with the covenant of God, doesn't it? Right? Somebody shake your head yes or no or something. So that's the covenant. What's going on here? Ezekiel is in Babylon. He's not in Israel. He's in Babylon. It is believed that he was carried away into Babylon in the second captivity because Israel kept going after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech for 500 years under kings and for 350, 400 years under judges, judges, that God carried them away into captivity. Carried northern Israel away in 722 B.C. Northern Israel was the ten northern tribes. They were split into two nations because of Solomon's apostasy. How in the world could Solomon be so apostate? Solomon was the son of David. He was a godly man, a good man, but when he married 700 wives and 300 concubines, which were secondary wives, they turned his head away from God. How? I don't know. You need to watch out who you marry. They, they turn your head away. And so God split the nation into two nations, northern Israel, which was headed up by the tribe of Ephraim. He was the second-born son of Joseph. So actually, northern Israel was ruled by Joseph. It was given to Ephraim, second-born. And southern Judah was comprised of the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And they were carried away in 586 B.C. It is believed, and I believe this, that the Assyrians, when they carried northern Israel away, they stole their pictures of the cherubim. The cherubim, you'll notice, have the bodies of a lion, have the head of an eagle, They've got the head of a man. Here's the body of an of a ox. And it's believed they took these cherubim. Here's another head of an eagle, another body of a lion, head of a man, eagle. It's believed that they, we know that it was Israel that had these cherubim first because God put cherubim at the, in the garden and he, to, to keep Adam and Eve going back in the garden, eating of the tree of life and living forever. That's the very last verse of the fourth chapter, of the third chapter, excuse me. So we know that belongs to Israel. When they carried them away, it's believed that the Assyrians, they like to worship anything, so when they start tearing the temple, when they start carrying away northern Israel, they don't tear the temple down. They tear the temple down in southern Judah. But they see a lot of these, these uh, uh, figures that Israel has. It's believed they took them. So when you get to southern Judah being carried away, they had five deportations, one in 605 B.C., one in 597 B.C., and it is believed that Ezekiel, these were peaceful deportations. Every, all the men who worked in metals that could build weapons, they took them off. They took them off into Babylon, carried them all to Babylon. And it's believed that Daniel and Ezekiel, and Ezekiel, or Zeke, 
were carried off in the second captivity. And here is Ezekiel over here in Babylon. Ezekiel is over here, and he is telling Israel back over here 600 miles away, 650, 600 to 650, what's going to happen to them in 586 B.C.? Everything that Ezekiel's talking about, he's, see if I can find something with him in it. Uh, I'll get it here in a minute. He's over here in Babylon. Here's the Euphrates River. Runs down and runs into the Tigris River. So he's over here. Ezekiel's over here. He's been carried away. About 650 miles. I always have to come up here because this is the Arabian Desert. Nobody travels across there. The Bible will always tell you that judgment came from the north. And then it would say it comes from the east. Well, it comes from the east and the north. To come into Israel and destroy Israel, you had to come from the east if you were Babylon or the Assyrians, and you had to come in from the north. So that's how they came in, carried him away. So Ezekiel's carried away from Jerusalem over to Babylon. And he's telling, he's telling people all through the book of Ezekiel what's going to happen to you in 586 B.C. And he's telling them, and it starts describing the chariots that's coming in. And the chariots that come in, here's what they've got. Well, let me see here. I'll get it in a minute. The chariots that's coming in are going to have the six-spoked wheels. A war chariot had six spokes on it. That's the very picture of the Star of David. That's going to show the judgment of God that's coming upon Israel. And this is the it was said by the ancients that David wore on the screen, huh? on the what? On the I know that. I just want to leave that up there. <laughs> it was said by the ancients that David wore the star of David or wore the menorah on his shield. The menorah is the seven candlesticks. The seven candlesticks is called Shield of David. That's called the Shield of David or the Star of David. And when this came in, they had on the sides of the chariots, they had cherubim. They have a lion on this side, an eagle on the other side. That is, this was the wheel inside of a wheel. When I first saw this, am I out of time? Yeah. I'll have to come back next week. Boing. <laughs> That's called a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> cliffhanger is the old movies where they would have the hero going off the cliff and don't know if he's going to come out and they go, boing. Of course, old people remember that. You remember that? <coughs> Anybody seen the cliffhangers? Yes, yes. <laughs> I gotta, I'll just come back to Ezekiel and explain this. Because this is the wheel in the wheel. When I first saw this, after having studied this, Or I need to get all those together. I saw this chariot wheel when I first saw it. I don't know what happened to it. 
here. I saw this wheel and this wheel, and I saw this Star David, this hexagon. I got a lot to tell you about hexagons. Your body is made up of billions of hexagonal shaped carbon atoms. Billions of hexagons. They're everywhere in nature. It's the most common nature thing that's out there. It's the strongest structure you can build. You want to build a house that will be hard to blow it down in a hurricane, build it in the shape of a hexagon. That is a super, super structure. I'll come back next week and go into Ezekiel and we'll see these four beasts with the chariots coming in to destroy southern Judah. But it'll show you that God's covenant is with them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Lord, I, I don't know what to say sometimes. I just want to impart the truth to God's people. Let them know the covenant is with us. You're going to deliver us. Thank you for everything you've shown us. Fight our battles. Open up every door for the ministry possible. We'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. I know that's a lot of stuff. And... Uh, I hope you can get a hold of it. Huh? I, I love you. You love me? You want some gum? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love you. I want some gum. He said, I still love you. I want some gum. You want the yellow gum? Huh? Huh? No, thank you. You don't want yellow? No. What can you want? I don't know if I have any of the other gum. I don't have any other gum. Huh? Will you take the yellow? Yeah. Okay. I gotta bring some of that other here. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Hey, Henry. From last week, you were absolutely right about the balances, but there are other salts as well. There's other what? Other salts. Salts. Yeah. I knew there was. Yeah, I read about that. Are on the right side that they're in on number seven on the periodic chart. What you need to do is take time to stop and after sometimes other than after church. Uh, okay. It's hard for me to concentrate right also, now. Which um, I will send this to the box, you know. To what? I'll send this to the box, my my tie. To the box. Bo you know, box number the address. What is it? To the church. Box 139, whatever it is, Andersonville. That's I my tithe, my monthly tithe. Oh, that's your tithe. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 And uh, thank you. I was not feeling well, let me get that. back with you because I got these other people. You're on about because the formula is I'm not going to be able to concentrate right now. Hexagonal dunes on Mars. Yeah. Yeah, I've got hexagonal I've got a water is the healthiest water for you. And that's why 
tie for the needy. Okay. So the head side. Well, let me get out here and talk to some people. I can't try to concentrate. It's hard for me. What you doing? Jim, how you feeling? Did I make your brain hurt? No, I'm following you. But you, uh, you understand this. You've heard it. Uh, you've heard a lot. Going my 11th year here. Listen. I love you. Yeah, she's been with us a long time. It's a long time. This is Henry. You ain't Henry? I mean, how you doing? Uh, Wonderful. Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, 6 minus 2 times 180 gives you 720, and it's hexagonal uh -huh. 6. 6 into 720 gives you well, you, need to, you need to sit down with me and show me that okay. when I got time. Oh, okay. And okay. you can do it for the pentagon. You can do it for the square. You can do it for the octagon. It's mathematically It's mathematically right structured. Right I know it is. Yes. I know it is. Right. And it's the healthiest and the best. You're, you're right on the money. Thank you. Your brain hurting? Yes. <laughs> a little bit. What are you doing? It was good. Okay, how's Mary? She don't feel good. I love it when you get deep down, down in those nooks and crannies, man. Well, without definition, Revelation is not hard to understand when you know where it's referring to. If you go back to the brazen sea and it was made out of the glasses of the women, then it's a glassy sea. It's real simple. Yeah. If you gotta you got to go back to where it began. You got seven candlesticks in the first chapter of Revelation. What for? The Jew Jewishness of it all? I've never heard anybody even approach Revelation from a Jewish viewpoint. They just try to make up Most stories. Say, I don't have to know Old Testament. I just, we'll, just, we'll just put that over here. And, and they say, these are four beasts around the throne of God. Now, this throne, somewhere in the tribulation period, is going, going golly. People are, they can't see because they don't study. They don't define everything. I think that was the first time I've heard you say that they would have, they had the cherubim first because it was guarding the uh, Yeah, and not only that, not only that, but in the ninth chapter, God makes his covenant with the beast of the field, with the cattle, with the fowl. It wasn't the Assyrians. The Assyrians didn't invent anything. They stole everything they got from God. That's why Baal was called the Lord. That meant that is what Baal meant was the Lord, but God wouldn't let his people call him that. It's they stole everything from God. Everything everything traces back to what God originally had. What are you doing? How are you? <laughs> what are you doing, our guy? What are you doing? Did you meet these visitors up here? No, well, no, these aren't visitors. Oh, okay, I'm, gonna say. I'm talking about the visitors up here, yeah. the tall guy there. Oh, you can't miss them. Huh? He's tall guy. <laughs> Zach has been here since he was this tall. He loves the truth, don't you? She was just telling me yesterday. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a different type of world, man. Like, <laughs> friends are hard to come by and people don't want to hear you. Yeah. They don't want to hear it. At all. Do they? At all. And his older brother is Sam. What you doing there? Is his eyes turning? No. Or do they look like they are? They're still gray. They're, they're they look blue. Kind of white, don't they? I guess. <laughs> they're blue. Hey, brother Jim. Hey, what are you doing? Enjoyed the service. service. I'm, I'm glad you did. Hey, Tim. <laughs> Davion, what are you doing? Hey, Andrew. How you doing, bro? Pretty good. How you doing? Hey. 
Is that brain scrambling this morning? Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, that it's was a lot of stuff. Yeah. I, I know you held back too. All it all it has to be is defined. Yes. That's all. Yes. What you doing? Did you get some gum? Yeah. You did. Did you get gum? Yeah. You did. Did you get gum? No. Yes, he did. No, she did it. Who? She gets Paris. some. Well, here, here's you some gum. Oh, there it is. I have some. You already had some, Aaron. I didn't have the ring gum. No. Here you go. No, well, you want some gum? Here. Well, here. Thank you. White gum. Say thank you. What about me? It could be two jeans, one of them. But anyway, it's. Where's your daddy? Hey, them. You tried doing? to sneak past us without saying hi. I caught you. Why didn't you? <laughs> How y'all doing? Hey, where I used to work. I didn't know if it cheaper. Hey, Pastor, I got mixed up for a minute when you were doing the bow thing. The, the rainbow is when God's at peace with us, right? He was not yeah, but it was his bow was hung but, at peace. And the, this bow... Yeah, you find Jesus like coming back with a bow on his head in Revelation. The... Uh, Thank you. 